Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 446. Written by Pepper Antique. It's less worship and more, Leendar explained to the wolves, who'd grown visibly more relaxed as he spoke. Um, it would be more accurate to say that we show deference to her. But she's an asshole. One of the wolves further back retorted. We weren't given any choice in any of this. And she just wanted us to kill people. Anyone we found. On the first point. Linda replied. You're right. A bit crass. But right. She's a goddess. One thing they all seem to have in common is not caring for the desires of their adherents when compared to their own. He admitted with a slight shake of his head. He remembered hearing the goddess's voice a few times when he'd been younger. As for the latter. She didn't want you to kill. It's rare that she desires killing, save from her champions. It is much more likely that she simply wanted you to convert more people. And as new wolves, those two things would have been hard to do separately for most of you. Then why make us do it? Another asked. Vickers had been watching this conversation, chase its tail, so to speak, for nearly twenty minutes now. He was tempted to step in. But he didn't really want to. He'd actually been surprised that the Elder hadn't taken any offense at the criticism of his deity. But he'd also been informed that the wolves here hadn't had a good first impression of her. His phone went off again, for the thirtieth time. Atrophar looked at him curiously. I'll be right outside. He said to her as he pulled it from his pocket. Then he saw the red border around the screen, and quickly rushed outside. Choi was speaking before he'd even gotten it to his ear. Jesus fuck Vickers you couldn't pick up sooner. He was yelling into the phone. Choi? What the fuck's going on? Why are you Yuzi? Vickers shut the fuck up. Choi said. Normally that would have pissed Vickers off coming from the young Mustang. But something in his tone said it was serious. Open the door. And make it big. What? Vickers asked, as he quickly moved outside into the open air, where hopefully the room full of words might struggle to hear any of the conversation. Now? Just do it. Choi demanded. He's here. Joey's back. Vickers stared at the phone as if it had just tried to bite him. Oh, fuck. Vickers said as he began running over to the black SUV that had dropped him and the other two off. He didn't bother with the rear hatch. Vickers? The phone sounded. Just a minute. He replied as his hand punched through the rear window as if it was made of paper. He grabbed his bag and began opening it and dumping its contents, mainly clothes, out into the trunk of the vehicle. Where are you? He asked as he shook out the last few contents. About thirty minutes from the capital. James said. I'm gonna set it up using the embassy main gate so make yours big. Vickers got the last shirt out and flipped the duffel bag inside out quickly. On it. He said as he saw the printed calculations there. I'll get started. I'll ring when I get set up. Roger. Choi replied. Whatever you do. You and the other words can't come through. That actually caused Vickers to pause for a moment. What? Why? He asked, confused as to why he wouldn't be allowed to join in whatever fight was happening. You near the other two? James asked. Vickers looked at the door to the barracks, where one of the airmen had taken up position to see what was going on. No. He replied. I'm outside. He took out a moon. Choi explained. It's messing things up. That got Vickers to pause again. Holy shit he said before beginning to run again. Ooh I hope this actually works. James thought as he continued riding. He had no idea about whether or not he and Vickers' backup plan was feasible. Even Vilairi hadn't been certain when he'd asked her about it. He'd wanted to have Vickers test it at some point while he was on Earth. If it worked, great, if not then that was simply useful info. Now it was going to be a gamble. One that they would have to at least try, even if it failed. The only other alternative was relying on two faulty machines, one faultier than the other, 
and hoping for the best. And even then, most people would likely explode from the trip. He and Steve reared up as James pulled on the drake's reins. He leaped off and slid down the massive reptile as he ran toward the house, leaping over the low stone wall as he did. He'd made the decision to detour here when they'd been about five miles from the capital. He'd seen what the moon's destruction, or cleansing, had done to people as he'd begun passing the outskirts of the city. People were panicking. And crowds had formed around members of the folk, all of whom had collapsed, and seemed to be in some kind of stupor. Their forms were more human now. But their fur and feathers and, other things, were in a state of flux. They seemed to go from being short, like towards the new moon, to being full and bushy like during the full moon. But one thing was common among all of them. They were terrified, and in pain. James burst through the door with an explosion. He'd used his full strength to slam into it with his currently numb wolf arm. The result was an explosion of splinters as he stumbled against the far wall. Yell. He yelled into the house. Mel. Tilo. JJA, the confused and pained voice of Yale gasped. James. There was also the sound of crying nearby. James rushed toward the voice. He found Yale in the living room, in his arms was the sobbing form of Mella, and he was reaching toward the room that the kids used as a playroom. It looked like he'd been struggling to crawl toward it. Yell. He said as he rushed over and picked up the two werewolves. Where's Tilo? Yell pointed toward the playroom as James leaned him against his couch. Stay here. James told him. I'm gonna get you guys out of here. What what, Yell struggled to ask. The second moon is gone. James said simply. He ran into the room before Yale could try to ask any more. Tilo was spasming as he slumped onto the small desk that Yale had made for the two pups. James scooped him up into his arms and then ran to the linen closet. He grabbed a few of the thickest blankets and went back to the living room. G gone? Yale asked in confusion. Yeah. James said as he laid out the blankets and tied the ends together so that they formed a simple hammock. Then he put Yale on it, moving him like he was a casualty in a field exercise. It's a long story. He said as he then placed Mella and Tilo in Yale's arms. Then he dragged them out of the house. Steve come on. He yelled and the drake eagerly clambered over the low wall and moved up close. He'd seen James carry someone like this once before at Jade Sport. James tied Yale and the pups up the same way as he had Elixir back then. Hold on to him as tight as you can. He yelled down at Yale. I'm getting you to the castle. With that he kicked Steve back into motion and began running full speed for the castle again. He didn't notice the way the remaining moon seemed to be accelerating through its orbit. But he could feel the world shaking even more violently as a result. The other moon was completely gone now. He yelled at a group of people as he passed them. He couldn't help them. He didn't have time. But he could at least give them a chance. Get to the castle. He commanded them. Get any folk you can find to the castle. It's the only chance. But he kept riding. Vilairi stumbled as she ran down the hallway. She braced herself against the wall, shielding Joel as she tried not to fall down. The quakes were getting stronger. Her head pounded, with a lot of the pain focusing around her antlers. And based on his wailing cries, Joel was dealing with a lot of the same. It made sense. An entire source of magic and deific power for the world had been, well, she didn't really know what had happened to it. The only thing that made any sense was that her former apprentice, and short-lived lover, Joey, had returned with the full power of the cleanser attached. Either that or some mage somewhere had made a wrong calculation in their experimentation. A very, very, wrong calculation. But she kind of doubted that was the case. She stumbled into the command room, knocking over a scurrying scribe as they tried to get past with some intel and command missives. Have all the soldiers take up litters? The king commanded of the people around them. Every hand. Get our people here. The bloody moon is gone. She blurted out as she got to the table and began trying to quiet the fussy baby. 
the king didn't even acknowledge the statement, and in hindsight she imagined he was already aware of that fact. Somebody get a message to the Lunar Council. Marcos said to one of the soldiers wearing Griffin Rider armor. We must get in contact with them. They are bound to be in turmoil. Fly. He said, sending the soldier running as they nodded at the order. Amina entered the room. It's Joseph. She said as she moved over to the station near her father. She spared a sorrowful glance Vilairi's way as she passed. He's returned. Where are the twins? The king asked. Where's Major Choi? The twins are with their grandmother, who's helping take care of the were children being brought to the healing ward. Amina answered. James is on his way. Riding fast. There was a crash nearby, followed by a yelp of surprise and pain, as one of the braziers fell from the wall and landed on a scribe. But they were more startled than actually hurt, so it was only a temporary distraction. Put those out. Amina commanded. Glow runes only. The last thing we need is a fire. What are these bloody quakes? The king demanded as he steadied an ink pot that had splashed over the paperwork he was dealing with. James said that they were the result of the moon being taken. Amina informed him. They're going to get worse. How can the moon cause quakes? The king asked in return. It's called gravity. Vilairi cut in. I don't know a lot about it. But I've read some about it in the books and information Earth has made available. The bigger something is the more it has. And moons are a lot bigger than you'd think from looking at them. She looked at Amina. He said they'd get worse? She asked. Amina pointed out toward the outside world. Have you seen the rings? Oh are what's left of them anyways. Vilairi hadn't. But she had seen the streaks raining down in the sky. Oh gods. She said under her breath. James has a plan. Amina said with a hand on her father's shoulder. We need to speak with Earth. About what? Her father asked as he felt Amina begin to haul him to his feet unexpectedly. What can they possibly do about this? Let us request asylum for our people. She said. Everyone in the room froze at the sound of the words. Asylum? Her father asked. What? Amina hauled her father by the arm out of the room and to the nearby window. Then she pointed up at the sky. The closer moon, the one with the slightly reddish tint which they called Teledras, was moving faster than they'd ever seen it move before. Even now it was almost ready to dip below the horizon. An act of its associated god to be certain. The ice crystals and asteroids that composed the planet's rings, though the king was only vaguely aware of that fact, were no longer in a ring formation. Instead they were scattered, as if someone had dropped a piece of ice and that ice had shattered and sent pieces flying. Even as he watched, the closest of them began to enter the planet's atmosphere and burn up, causing the bright streaks in the sky. Beyond that there was, something. Something he'd never seen in person because it had always been considered too dangerous to let him near it outside of Jade Sport. Something that was hard to look at. That seemed to force his eyes away on an almost unconscious level. More than a third of the space beyond the planet's ring was dark and full of blight. It had been a long time since the king had felt true, soul-shaking, mind-numbing, fear. Not since he'd been a young commander much like his daughter had been years before, and had gone through his first battle. But he felt it now. Amina shook him out of it. Father! This is most likely the end. She said as she literally shook him to draw his attention. James says so. The sky says so. Every instinct in my body says so. This time it's not about winning. She said sternly as he seemed to understand what she was saying. He nodded. Then turned back toward the door to the command room. Summon all forces. He said as his throat began to glow with the light of his voice of command power. Use the doors in the transit room. Mags get the rest of them working. Send word far and wide. He paused for a moment as the first of them began scattering. Save as many of our people as you can. He commanded. Damn the security of it. 
if they are alive and able to be brought here. Bring them all. Open the vaults. Equip for mobility and healing. He looked at his daughter as his throat began fading. Take charge. He said loudly enough for the rest of them to hear. I'll go speak to Earth. He looked at Velary and Marcos. Get the machine up and running. Use everything you can to keep it powered. Then he looked back at Amina and spoke much more softly. Protect your family. He said, the message clear enough to not need elaboration. She nodded. Then he began jogging toward the embassy. Amina stepped back into the room. You heard him. She yelled. Let's save our people. The room exploded back into motion. 